Well, welcome everyone. Uh, it's so, uh, it's so nice to see everybody here uh, on such short notice. Uh, this is a great opportunity for us to uh, bring you up to speed on the work of quite a, f quite a few members of your, uh, 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 the, of your colleagues around the University of Missouri system. And so we're anxious to be able to show you uh, where we are in the development of uh, translational precision medicine uh, at the University of Missouri. So welcome everybody. I want to take the opportunity here not only to welcome those of you who have uh, come to Columbia today uh, to be a part of this um, um, uh, enterprise, but also to those of you who are online uh, and who are watching the live streams at all of our different campuses, thank you for taking the time out of your day to be here as well. Uh, I want to recognize specifically a few people who uh, I've seen in the audience. Uh, we have a couple of uh, our uh, members of our board of curators here, Avery Welker, who's our student uh, curator representative, and uh, Phil Avery. Uh, Phil Snowden, who's back here at the end of the food line. Uh, one of our uh, curators from Kansas City. Um, I haven't seen any of the other curators here, but if you're online, uh, again, welcome to all of you as well. Uh, as many of you know, we'll have a Board of Curators meeting here on the Columbia campus tomorrow. Uh, I'd also like to take the opportunity to uh, recognize uh, the chancellors of the uh, four universities uh, in the uh, UM system. Uh, Chancellor Cartwright is here in the audience. I don't see any of the other chancellors, but I, I'm hoping that they're online. Uh, uh, our provosts uh, from the campuses, I hope uh, you're having an opportunity to view the um, um, proceedings today as well, and to, to several uh, vice chancellors and other um, uh, general officers from the university, welcome and uh, glad to have you uh, a, um, as a part of this program. So what we intend to do today is to give you a progress report. Where are we on the TPMC? Many people have heard about the TPMC. Uh, many people have been engaged in planning and developing the concepts around the TPMC. Uh, many of you don't have any idea uh, how far this project has gone, and the intent today is to really give you a clear idea of where we are in the project. Um, the, the focus of the TPMC really is to give the University of Missouri and all four of its universities an opportunity to grow and to be part of the national um, investment in uh, global health care through precision medicine uh, activities, and you'll hear a little bit more about precision medicine here in a few minutes so that you understand what we're talking about. Um, we, what, we view this opportunity as an opportunity to continue to build on our culture of, culture of excellence and success, to encourage multi-campus collaborations where they're effective, to use data to inform our decisions going forward, and most importantly, to invest in facilities that we know will create critical, critical research collisions among our faculty needed to advance the science. While impressive, we're going to show you a little bit of the vision today. For the first time, you're going to see what we, what we see in this facility. Uh, and I think you're going to be impressed with the work of Burns and McDonald out of Kansas City in the design of, um, of, of the vision of our, the, our faculty who've been working on this project. But there's much more to be done. This is just step one uh, uh, around the state in solving grand challenges that really confront us in the healthcare industry at this point in time. This is an opportunity for us to increase our uh, uh, footprint in, in uh, biomedical research uh, and to have impact uh, around the state and the nation. Because of this, last December, the UM System Board of Curators voted the TPMC its number one capital project around the system. So we are very excited to be able to show you this um, um, project at this point in time. Um, so we're gonna do this through innovation and entrepreneurship technology advancement, and industry partnerships and engagement. The TPMC is going to be the heart of this enterprise going forward. An innovative center of multidisciplinary discovery, leveraging both the sciences and the humanities to help solve some of the world's grand challenges. We could not do this around the UM system if it weren't for the support and the hard work 
of the UM System Office and President Moon Choi, who's in the back of the room here. So Moon, thank you for that. So what you're gonna to see today is how we envision the TPMC working together with all system universities through the Precision Medicine Initiative to align our expertise and further propel this university to the top of the Precision Medicine Initiative. As important as the TPMC is to Mizzou and our campus community, it's equally important to those, uh, our, our uh, sister institutions around the state and to those we serve across the state and across the nation. So what I'm gonna do now is turn the program over to the faculty and the leaders who've been really working very, very hard to develop this enterprise, give you a firsthand view of where we are in the planning and give you an idea of what's to come in the very, very near future. Let me start by introducing Dean Elizabeth Leboa, who's worked very, very closely with faculty groups and uh, leadership groups around the system to bring this vision to its current state of reality. Elizabeth Leboa is the uh, Dean of the College of Engineering and the Vice Chancellor for Strategic uh, Partnerships across the system. So, Elizabeth. Thank you so much. I am so excited to have the opportunity to share this with you. Um, as Mark so beautifully alluded to, what we're really talking about when we talk about the translational precision medicine complex is about improving the lives of Missourians and decreasing the cost of healthcare. Those are the true goals around the translational precision medicine complex and the precision medicine initiative. And I'm going to briefly, and I, I, I focus on briefly, go through some of the logistics we've been working on, uh, but I really want to highlight, and you're going to hear it from the working group members, these faculty across all four universities who have been working so hard to help us reach these milestones and in particular really delineate the research and science that's going to be happening here. Um, and of course, I have the... Um, wonderful honor and opportunity to speak for multiple colleges. And I see we have deans of these five colleges and schools who are critically uh, uh, playing a role every day, joining our, our meetings, our calls. Um, and so I see Carolyn Henry here from the Dean of Veterinary Medicine School. Now she's got a leg injury, she might not stand up. We've got Patrick De La Fontaine. Uh, Med is Pat Oker here for Arts and Science. No, but, ah, but we got Chris Pierce, uh, Dean of ADR, and Chris Dalbert, maybe of CAFNR, or represent, representative. But these are, thank you. So these are just five of the colleges and schools that play a regular role in it, but uh, really uh, incredible interdisciplinary collaboration. So let me just talk briefly from a logistics standpoint, where we are just in the translational precision medicine complex facility planning and moving forward. Of course, conversations around the TPMC have been going on since 2014. This is not a new idea, but now it's really hit the ground running and it's incredibly exciting. So um, it, the design team, Burns and McDonald, who you will hear from, uh, were approved and hired by the Board of Curators. So they were engaged in August, approved and hired in September 2018, and that's when the design phase started. They have been working tirelessly with multiple groups across the campus to really focus and narrow down how do we make each of the facilities within the TPMC leading edge, state of the art. Uh, and they'll be talking quite a bit about that. Uh, in November 2018, Whiting Turner was selected as a construction manager at risk. We expect, um, I don't know the exact date of this, this might still be to, to be determined, or this might be the actual date, that the Board of Curators will then hold a special meeting on May 20th, 2019, because we expect the final design to come from Burns and McDonnell March 1. And I'm looking at Rich saying, there you go, we're expecting it. Uh, so that will happen, and then the Board of Curators will uh, at their special meeting, analyze funding and project design, and assuming that is all approved, then the first bid package will be sent out from the construction standpoint. A ceremonial groundbreaking is still to be determined. This is, uh, in, this, uh, this is actually when, for July 2019, is when excavation and site grading will start. 
Deep foundation work starts September 2019, structure complete November 2020, interior fit out complete and owner starts the setup August 2021, October 19th, 2021, 8.45 a.m., doors open, ribbon cutting, operational uh, rollout, we are running. So uh, Gary Ward uh, is in here, he, he backs this constantly. Where, there he is, fantastic. No, that's Gary Allen. No, no, that's not Gary Ward. Fantastic for IT. Gary Ward for Vice Chancellor for Facilities and Operations. Um, but we are right on schedule and it's moving along great. Now, I've uh, had the opportunity to present this already to faculty council. We've shown this slide before. Chancellor Cartwright has shared it with board of curators. As I mentioned, of course, the number one goals, really, of the TPMC, we want to improve the quality of life for Missourians and decrease the cost of health care. Translational is the first word in that uh, facility's name at this point. We want to translate the science actually into clinical products and technologies. But these are the expectations for the outcome metrics. We will have the very best in the world in this facility. Now don't get wedded to this number. We know there's 60 PIs. We don't know if it's exactly 30 new, 30 current. We're just estimating at this point, there might be already about 30, about half of the faculty here, about half to be recruited from around the world of global leaders, uh, but that, that is uh, an approximation. Research expectations, of course, these numbers are based on that are, these faculty are working on center grants, and through these center grant initiatives, then these are how we are generating these research expenditures. Uh, industry support, we're doing an incredible amount of work already to uh, engage corporate partners to work closely with us to truly develop centers of excellence and help to drive the technology that will be occurring in the TPMC. Now, when we talk about this precision medicine initiative, uh, I, I can't overemphasize the impact in the need of the interdisciplinary strengths that we have across our four universities. So we talk about the scientists, clinicians, engineers in the facility doing this research, but of course when we really then think about, well, how do we translate that? We're gonna take uh, uh, work upon our strengths with the entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurial environment that we have here and across the system. Talking in, with our law colleagues about how, how do we uh, best optimize the IP. Uh, precision medicine examples, a lot of people hear the word precision medicine and think this is just about my DNA. You, you, you get something about my genetics. No. Um, work here at MU and really and also some incredible work at UMKC has shown it's it, when we talk precision medicine, it's not just genetics. It's our diet, environment, and lifestyle. And we're taking all of that into account. And of course, in the translational precision medicine complex, then we don't just stop at these clinicians, scientists, and engineers that are working when we think about from the traditional wet lab approaches, but also the big data analytics. How are we really using the best and latest in, in AI, machine learning, bioinformatics to take all the data that's being generated and come up both with new um, uh, ways to diagnose and to treat? Um, and I, I have a list of some of these areas. You're going to hear from the three working groups. The focus of the TPMC is how do we truly drive technologies, research, and innovations to address cancer, neurological disorders, and vascular disease. And in this uh, life cycle, we talk about basic research, but of course we also have the ability to run clinical trials here, translate that to clinical applications, scale up, best practices, commercialize revenue, and again, continue to drive the research. I want to just uh, provide a slide as well. I've been talking about the incredible interdisciplinary strengths across all four, sister, uh, four universities. And so we talk about some of the partners already here on the MU side, but you'll hear from the working groups and I will highlight uh, and show all of the faculty members across all four universities who are working so hard to uh, move this whole process forward, but in particular drive the science and research forward. Um, and of course, with uh, those faculty investigators, the industry partners that we're also looping in, huge, uh, incredible partner with the Truman VA, 
that is also a part of these discussions and work moving forward. And again, outcomes, we, we talk about improving patient care, decreasing disparities in access to care, but of course the economic impact on the state with respect to new companies, therapeutics, biomaterials, and pharmaceuticals. And we might hear uh, quite a bit more, I would imagine, from the cancer working group. Dave Robertson, the director of the MU Research Reactor, is vice chair of that group and can speak um, eloquently to already four radioisotopes that have been de developed out of um, uh, uh, technology from MU Research Reactor that are being used now for, for treating cancer. But let me uh, talk about some of the, the best aspect of, of what has been occurring, in my opinion, with respect to the Precision Medicine Initiative, is the opportunity to speak to faculty across all four universities who are truly driving this forward. Uh, I'm going to ask um, any members, we have a, so many people that I know are joining us through live stream, but any members of our working groups who are here in the audience, would you please stand? Uh, if you're here, uh, don't now don't be shy because I even see some of the chairs hesitating to stand. Please stand. Um, thank you so much for all the work that you are doing on this. Um, and uh, yes, thank you. For the cancer working group, Jeff Bryan from Veterinary Medicine is the chair. Dave Robertson from the MU Research Reactor is vice chair. From the vascular group, we've got Carrie McDonald is the chair. And Prasad Kalyam from uh, engineering is, is the vice chair. Uh, Carrie McDonald is uh, with School of Medicine. And with uh, neurological, we have Tally Altes, also with, uh, with medicine, who is the chair, and David Schultz with arts and science, who is the vice chair. So incredible work, and you'll be hearing from them. Now, they have not had a trivial agenda and tasks that were asked of them as soon as they were named. President Choi, and, and they're giggling up here because they're going to, yes, they have truly matched and, and hit every single one of these deadlines. Uh, the required items through a, an email from President Choi and Chancellor Cartwright was that any critical changes to the programming space needed to be provided by September 20th. Major instrumentation, I won't go through every detail here. You can read that, but that was due by September 25th. Um, a short executive summary that uh, could be shared more broadly with faculty and leadership across all four sister all four of our, our universities was uh, provided by October 12th, and longer strategic plans was provided by October 28th. They even, um, as of uh, November 17th, provided drafts and their suggestions of operational plans because what's happening in this facility is very unique than what we've typically done. No college or school owns space. Operational plans are, and governing structure is really about what is the very best cutting edge research that can be translated to solve and move forward major metrics and how we're treating these neurological disorders cancer and vascular disease. And so they, they provided their um, uh, suggestions for governing structure, research group assembly and disassembly, advisory board suggestions by November 17th. What they've been working hard very recently is uh, tier one and tier two system proposals that they think can really uh, highlight what can be done in the TPMC. They're also now working on center grants. These are major federal grants. Um, that again, to uh, highlight the unique UM system and MU strengths in these areas. And uh, those are what they'll be talking about, I'm sure, today. Uh, just as, uh, uh, this is just the amount of time that Mark and I and the president and chancellors when they, and the other deans, when they have the opportunity to join, this is when we check in and talk to these working groups. So it's about every two weeks since they were named. Uh, that began in September 7th. Our next one, we had one yesterday. Our next one is February 18th. And they are really um, also now thinking about how do we best tell the story and talk to our legislature, legislators, and that will, uh, they're presenting a legislative showcase, and, um, and I'll leave it to them to talk some more about what they're doing. So for just two slides, and then after this I have a Q&A, but we might skip it to make sure we have time for general Q&A. Um, I want to, I, I talked, I'll ask Bill Turpin to come up, um, who as you all know is the director of the Missouri Innovation Center, but also uh, the interim associate vice chancellor for economic development in Mark McIntosh's um, uh, office. Uh, we are heavily focused in the TPMC on huge corporate sponsors. 
Bill also has great background on a, a discussions of valley of death and some of what can be done for the faculty working in the TPMC from um, accelerating some of what they're doing uh, to really translate that out. Bill. Thanks, Elizabeth. I just want to briefly talk about how entrepreneurship and innovation kind of intersects with the translational precision medicine complex. A lot of uh, drugs and um, new therapeutics are developed by startups these days, often preceded by university research. But we have what we call the valley of death, where uh, until the drugs get further along and they get data sets behind them and we see the efficacy, corporations don't want to pick it up and license it from us. So it behooves us to get things through what we call the valley of death. So the translational precision medicine complex is kind of uniquely situated where a team could be in one location and get much further down across the valley of death than they could if they just had their lab facilities. So I have an example here where you could do basic investigation with federal funding in tissue samples, for instance, to cure a, a form of cancer. You could stay in the same building and use rodent models from the vivarium down below uh, to test it there. Um, the vivarium also supports large animals, so you could move into dogs, pig models for the human disease. And you could do all that without leaving. Along the way, you could use some of the facilities, clean rooms, uh, GMP manufacturing facilities, to make the, uh, the therapeutic that you're testing, and then eventually get it into a clinical trials unit here. So a lot of this really helps streamline the whole process of getting things translated from the lab out into the world. Um, along the way, funding is needed. So another initiative I'm working on is we call the Innovation Fund. I'm looking, that would be a statewide program. And it would fill a funding need um, kind of in the gap there. It's not university funding. A lot of it would come from private investors who want to invest in this and get involved in the ecosystem. And we would have a group that help, of experts that would help deploy it, and we would manage it and all. So it would be similar to the Coulter program we've been managing, but for the next stage. And so this is just another idea I'm working on to help put some of the financing we would need in place to, build, to really be able to get the projects flowing through the translational precision medicine complex. So thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. So like I said, um, in, instead of the Q&A, because I think we are a little tight on time, I, I will be turning it over to the working groups. There's one last thing I, I like to remind everybody. This cannot be done, in my opinion, anywhere else. We have the only and, and I'm just speaking from the, my MU hat. Well, I, I hope when the working groups come, on, come up here, they will also talk about, because they have so many faculty from all four of the universities, we have the only NIH-funded swine center in the country. We have the only NIH-funded rat center of any university in the country. We are one of only three universities in the country with an NIH-funded mouse center. We have the largest university research reactor of any university in the country. We are one of fewer than 10 universities here that have engineering medicine and veterinary medicine on the same campus. And when you think about the Kaffner strengths, in particular animal sciences, I think they're top 10 in the world and what we can do with the ability to truly bring our interdisciplinary strengths together and translate. It can't, in my opinion, this, we are in a unique space, place, and strengths that we can really change the landscape for healthcare. And I, I really think this is a game changer for Missourians. We talked about the standpoint from the large animal models. Of course, I, I'm looking at Dean Carroll and Henry. This is also for One Health. So, the treatments that can be done here will help not just um, humans, our human patients, but also our companion animal patients. It, it really is going to be an incredible facility. I'm going to stop there and I'm going to introduce our first speaker who's going to be coming up to represent the vascular working group, and that would be Carrie McDonald. Thank you.
Okay, well, <clears throat> I'd first like to thank the organizers for allowing me a chance to provide a uh, report um, from the Vascular Working Group. Uh, I'd first like to show the members of the group, which is presented earlier, and really thank them for the time and commitment that they put into uh, meeting um, so many required tasks uh, last semester. <clears throat> So, in retrospect, after sort of a whirlwind of events, um, it, this opportunity to work in a working group really provided a chance to uh, get a, gain an appreciation for the wonderful science that occurs uh, in cardiovascular and vascular biology. And then, really think about how we can take this basic science and advance it towards patient-centered care. And this is something that we have lots of translational projects going on, but me as a basic scientist, I really gained an appreciation for how we could build teams to help patients. And it's a, it's a vital task. Uh, cardiovascular disease is the number one killer in the United States. Uh, it has an enormous economic impact, and the survival rate really has not improved over the, over the past 30 years. So there's a a necessity for uh, precision-based science to, to help these patients. <clears throat> so, as was mentioned, uh, we had a number of tasks, and I'll just uh, uh, touch on a couple of them. So, one of the uh, charges was to identify strengths. So, as the group, we identified <clears throat> three strengths uh, in vascular uh, sciences. One is uh, Vascular biology, we have a long history of microcirculation control and lymphatic structure and function. Secondly is uh, cardiac biology. Um, with disease states, the heart remodels, and uh, we have experts in the remodeling process. We have experts in the electrical and mechanical function of single cardiac myocytes. A third area is wound healing. Uh, what, what are the processes that are involved in regeneration of tissues and how can we accelerate that. And then these smaller circles that illustrate some of the research themes that are going on throughout the system. And these are all juxtaposed to uh, uh, more chronic conditions, uh, gender physiology, obesity, uh, hypertension, diabetes, exercise, and aging. And we have lots of preclinical animal models that test mechanisms and processes that occur and treatments that occur, but the challenge was how do we translate that to patient outcomes? And we were fortunate in our group to have John Spurtis from UMKC and uh, the Mid-American Heart Institute, and he really helped us build up how we can start translating these findings uh, for improved patient outcomes and effective treatments. Now another, uh, or a natural, um, spin-off of these discussions are areas of enrichment. And I have listed here several areas of enrichment that, that the group came up with, and I'll touch on a couple of them. Uh, one of them is computer or computational modeling to better test our hypotheses. And I know there's a group in engineering now that has month monthly meetings on computational modeling. Um, in terms of targets for drugs, uh, drug design, drug delivery, uh, there's, that's an area of enhancement in those methodologies. And I know that uh, Zhao Qianzhu in physics is, is spearheading those efforts. Uh, there's an opportunity for uh, perhaps a recruitment of an expert in pluripotent stem cells. This allows for a cellular model to study uh, molecular mechanisms of disease. We're always looking for ways to improve uh, infrastructure in the clinical sciences, how we can drive our discoveries to trials and then to clinical practice. And as I mentioned, John Spurness has been helping us out with that. And Bill Fay provided a presentation for the group about the clinical sciences here at the School of Medicine. Other areas are uh, device development and uh, imaging technology. Uh, so many different imaging uh, technologies that are going to be part of this particular building. And because of that, we formed a, a group of experts in imaging modalities that can help with the sort of determining the proper technologies that are needed. <clears throat> so in terms of strategic plan, um, the idea is to 
um, provide the, the, or leverage the TPMC to uh, provide the most competitive uh, program level or center level uh, uh, projects. And in cardiovascular sciences, we have a, a rich history of, of program projects, but we really need to revitalize that with a uh, tough NIH funding situation. So as a group, we just came up with a paradigm for how to develop a, a, a program. Um, and it's nothing really innovative, but for this particular building, it's got to start from the top down. So it's clinically significant questions, and then there's all sorts of entry points to build up a team. And once we have a team, then we need time. The key is time and resources. So we have a timeline that varies depending upon, you know, how mature a particular group is, but it has phases of, of a proposal design. And then we got to really take a step back and see what the knowledge gaps are. We need time for design of experiments, preliminary data, uh, joint publications to build up reputations for the particular groups. And then that moves on to specific AIMS pages and, uh, and, and proposals and internal and external reviews. So that's the uh, strategic design uh, template that we've come up with. And one gratifying aspect of this that I hope that our working group has helped solidify is that we have several of these interdisciplinary uh, projects going on right now. Lots of this was driven by this, the strategic initiative program. Uh, just to name a few here, this is just a few uh, that I collected over the last uh, week. Um, and they, some of them span the various working groups. Uh, the first one has to do with uh, trapping uh, circulating tumor cells. Uh, the next two uh, are involve examining uh, vascular remodeling in disease states such as diabetes, obesity, and sleep apnea. Those two projects already have clinical sciences, scientists associated with them. Another project is approaches to treat uh, uh, cardiac uh, myopathies associated with muscular dystrophy, and that involves gene therapy approaches. Uh, there's a group in engineering working on bioinformatics infrastructure, so we can mine data to look at molecular sig signatures of disease states to better uh, diagnose and prognose and see how treatments are working. Uh, there's a group working on novel treatments to improve wound healing that includes the School of Nursing as well as the Department of Surgery. Uh, and then uh, a group at uh, s and that's uh, trying to develop improved higher resolution imaging of the heart and uh, the vasculature. <clears throat> so uh, that's sort of where we've been, where are we going now? Uh, really we got three things that we're going to try and keep doing. We're going to, the, the uh, running theme is clinically significant questions. So we're going to keep uh, addressing those questions, get the clinicians to the table to have those discussions. We really want to foster collaborations. That's what we're here for. And then uh, address issues from the leadership, like me standing up here today, as well as the legislative showcases coming up next week. So some action items are regular meetings. Uh, we'll take input on agenda for those. Anybody that wants to present about their group projects, uh, clinically significant questions. Uh, uh, a short-term uh, promotion is cardiovascular day which is February 26th in this building. It's the 26th annual, and it's a collection of scientists in, in the cardiovascular research arena uh, that will meet and present probably 50 posters about research in, in, uh, in the vascular arena, so you can see about common interests and complementary interests. Uh, another thought is to try and get some um, sort of um, reverse site visits, some NIH program officers to help with this in terms of program project planning grants. And really, I'm, uh, 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 our, our job is to help facilitate groups that are working towards program level uh, grants. So I'd just like again to thank the working group members uh, for their time and commitment. They've been able to carve out a lot of time. Um, and it's been a really uh, an excellent team to work with on this particular initiative. So. That concludes the report from the Vascular Working Group. Ooh, there's not another step there. All right. Thank you so much. And our next one is Jeff Bryan, who's the chair of the Cancer Working Group. And um, thank you so much, Carrie. And then we'll just press with that. Thank you for the opportunity to address you today. Uh, 
Uh, it's, it's been a real pleasure to be the chair of the, of the group. It's been a very humbling assignment looking at the amazing cancer research that happens across the system, and I want to introduce you to that uh, today briefly and help understand why cancer research is going to be so critical to the outcome and the success of this institution. Looking at the stats of cancer in the state of Missouri, about 35 to 36,000 Missourians will develop cancer this year. And unfortunately, about 13,000 will die of their cancer. So this is the second leading cause of death right behind cardiovascular disease. So very clearly a critical health problem. Uh, we have a huge problem with lung cancer in the state of Missouri. And I've heard the directors of the cancer centers in the Kansas City area talking about as, as Kansas City increasingly becomes a retirement destination, we will not be able to treat our way out of lung cancer in 20 years. And so we have to develop strategies to interrupt lung cancer much earlier, help interrupt the, the leading causes of lung cancer, particularly tobacco use and, and potentially now growing the vape use, especially among younger people in the state. And we need to address these across the state to meet the economic needs of our state and to meet the health needs of our citizens. I really want to thank the members of the Cancer Working Group, and I've arranged them on the right-hand side of the slide according to the main members of the group and the campuses that they represented. We truly had fantastic representation from our other campuses. We have incredibly active cancer research there, and we need to integrate it across the state, and a facility like the TPMC is really critical for that integration in order to leverage the discoveries in those locations and do the best we can. But as you'll see, we already have a track record of succeeding. I think this will accelerate it. I'd also like to thank the names on the left-hand side who, who gave ad hoc advice to our committee, assist, assisted us with understanding the needs of the facility. And I want to comment, too, that besides the meetings and the phone calls that Dr. LeBeau shared with you earlier, there have been many more meetings and many more hours put in with the design team to make sure that this is the kind of facility that really will serve the needs of all investigators. I will assure all the faculty members in the room that there is no one group that has really leveraged this cause to advance their own research or their own agenda, but this is a facility that I think we can all utilize very effectively and be very proud of when it's constructed. I'll include uh, the governance slide looking at the governance model that has been suggested, and this represents really each of the three groups' concepts behind this, that we see that there needs to be an overall scientific director of the facility whose job is to look across campus to evaluate projects and help direct them into the TPMC, to help reach out to industry, to, find, to identify funding that will be appropriate for the TPMC and identify companies whose interests match what the strengths of this facility are. And then within the TPMC, we need directors for each area that help facilitate the function of the groups, help to manage interactions of the group to try to really stimulate the kind of interactive collaboration that's necessary to foster new ideas, new development, and take things from you know, a development that may make it to a certain level and push it all the way over the goal line to translate them into clinical use. Uh, and it's going to be important to have broad representation in advisory bodies, so we make sure that what we're doing is relevant to the needs of the community, but relevant to the researchers on this campus as well, and to make sure this is fully representative. And I can't emphasize enough how critical it is for the cancer effort of the TPMC to integrate with the cancer efforts of Ellis Fischel Cancer Center, and specifically the push for cancer center designation through the NIH that we so desire for the cancer center. And Dr. Stavely O'Carroll gave an excellent presentation to the cancer focus group here on the UM campus a couple of months back, looking at the programmatic themes that have been identified in Ellis Fischel as necessary moving forward for cancer center designation. And those include cancer control and population sciences, which is a very broad net that includes a lot of epidemiology and understanding potentially of cancer causation. It includes tumor immunology that I'll talk a little bit more about, uh, developmental and experimental cancer therapeutics, which include our radiopharmaceutical capabilities on campus, and then cancer genes and molecular cellular regulation that really fit in with the precision medicine as effort as well. And I think these dovetail very nicely with what the working group independently constructed as areas of strength in our system. Certainly radiochemical medicine is an area of current strength and historical strength. Cancer immunology is the buzzword we all are reading about every day in the news, and we have an amazing wealth of talent in this system that can help advance that. 
Early cancer and minimal residual disease uh, detection will be critical, particularly for addressing issues, like I mentioned earlier, of this incredible burgeoning rate of lung cancer that's going to affect population in the state that we need to be able to address effectively and, and also economically. Uh, targeted delivery of therapeutics, as well as ultimately precision molecular medicine. This slide was developed to demonstrate our radiochemical medicine pipeline. And we used to call them radiopharmaceuticals, but there are so many opportunities now where radioactive materials can contribute to the utility of drugs and imaging therapeutics, diagnostic therapeutics in patients. And so looking at this model, this model assumes that we have a convergence of research of medicinal chemists, radiochemists, and general chemists, as well as nanomaterial scientists. So including the College of Engineering and the, the engineers across the system, and that through federal research grants and, and industry funding, we can develop a large stable of potential compounds that could be carried forward clinically. The university has already made a substantial investment in what used to be the nanomedicine building down by the reactor that we're now referring to as the Institute for Nanomedical Innovation. And in this area, we will have an incubator where new compounds can be developed in small animals, evaluating target acquisition and efficacy in rodent models that are well characterized. And we can make go, no go decisions at that point to then move into larger naturally occurring animals in the imaging centers at the a College of Veterinary Medicine, and particularly the PET Imaging Center, is something that we are working to build substantially as we have made a large investment there as well. Once we understand which of these compounds are effective in naturally occurring tumors of animals, they will become more attractive compounds to move into first-in-human studies. And once we have first-in-human data, that is when these potential drugs go from being interesting scientifically to very valuable commercially. And the best example I can give is the Lutathera example, where a, a very old compound, I actually used it in its exact form in my research work, did not know I was playing with what turned out to be a $3.9 billion drug at the time. And had we been able to carry that forward all the way into human human trials at Missouri, that could have been our $3.9 billion. As it is, the reactor makes all the lutetium that feeds that product for the entire world. And it's something that we cannot afford to miss these opportunities again. And so building these infrastructures will be critical, and we can feed the results of those drug projects back into the funding, the basic science, and continuing the cycle. Cancer immunology is another huge area where we have to make advances and we have a lot of expertise on campus. Uh, I have represented our, our Missourians from our children and the men and women of the state that might suffer cancer. And we have expertise on this campus in looking at uh, cancer vaccine preparation, developing adoptive T-cell therapies that are currently being tested both in the medical school, in mouse, and to move into human, and also in the veterinary college. We've just published uh, preliminary results in the past few months of our adoptive T-cell therapy in dogs with osteosarcoma, resulting in a better better median survival than even the standard of care that currently exists with a company that we are collaborating with in the Kansas City area. Looking at tumor immunotherapies, including nanoparticles, antibodies, nanobodies, peptides, and aptamers that can manipulate the immune system and cause the immune system to better recognize tumors is ongoing. And then groups on campus, particularly uh, in the immunocancer immunotherapy program, looking at combinations of chemotherapies and immunotherapy checkpoint inhibitors to try to improve outcome for cancers uh, in people through our current mouse model work. Early cancer and minimal disease detection is also prevalent in the MU system. Looking at can circulating tumor cells and exosomes, looking at circulating tumor DNA, they have identified markers of more aggressive disease and of survival in patients. Our engineering college has helped us develop novel ways of trapping these circulating tumor cells so that we can better, more rapidly identify them and understand which patients are at risk for this death. Uh, aptamers for target identification to, uh, to be able to identify markers of more aggressive disease in the patient naturally without having to do invasive biopsies, as well as RNA markers in circulation in exosomes and in tumor cells. 
All of these allow the opportunity to better monitor our patients, better predict their outcomes, and hopefully reduce health care costs by applying the necessary therapy when it's needed, not to all in case it's needed. And this will help improve the economics of our health care in the state. Targeted delivery of therapeutics is critical. Delivering a lethal dose of drug exactly to the cancer cells but not to the normal cells of the body where toxicity results is the optimal goal of cancer therapy. Using peptides and small molecules and antibodies and again aptamers, we can, we can deliver these things and MU and UM researchers are working on exactly these kinds of studies. Um, at Missouri S&T, they're working at DNA origami-assisted del drug delivery, where DNA constructs are targeting drugs directly to the genes of the, of the cancer cells, causing death and destruction there, but leaving the normal tumors, or leaving the normal cells of the body alone. Bioactive glass uh, constructs that can deliver light therapy or drug therapy over a period of time and are then biodegradable and do not leave residuum behind in the patient, uh, as well as poor forming peptides that poke holes in cancer cells and allow the drugs to penetrate at much higher concentrations. All of these are advances being made on UM system campuses, and we need a place to bring them together with the clinicians and the scientists that can advance them into clinical trials and make these a reality for the people of Missouri. Finally, precision molecular medicine overarches all of this, and I will, I will represent this with a DNA molecule, but has already been stated is much, much more than this. We can look at proteins, we can look at lipids, we can look at lifestyle, we can look at bacterial populations living in patients. But at the end of the day, the critical challenge to all of these therapies is to deliver what a patient needs, when the patient needs it, and the amount that they need, rather than delivering as much as, we can to as, much as they can tolerate and tolerate the toxicity associated with it, as well as the additional costs associated with both that toxicity and the larger doses of these compounds. We want to precisely deliver what the patient needs every single time. And this building will allow us to bring the researchers together to take all these advances that I've showed you and optimize them. I have purposely displayed them this way because it's simply true that the University of Missouri system is crowded with opportunity in the cancer field. And what we need to do is have a coherent management of these technologies so that we can identify the winners very quickly, move them into larger scale production and larger scale testing, and translate them to clinical trials to better deliver appropriate health care to the state of Missouri. Thank you, and my pleasure to next uh, bring David Schultz, who will be representing all the great work that's happening with the Neurological Group. Uh, so thank you for an opportunity to speak today uh, on behalf of the Neuro Group. If you know someone with Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, or struggling with a drug addiction, anxiety, depression, sleep disorders, spinal cord injury, autism, then you have a neuroscientist in the UM system who is working on their behalf, uh, and it is a, a pleasure to be able to represent them uh, on a day like today. Uh, the Neuro Working Group is a small subsection of that that tries very hard to recognize everything uh, that's going on in terms of contributions across the UM system. And I just want to remind you who those people are uh, across the system and thank them very much for their, uh, their hard work this past semester. Uh, we've gotten a lot of good work done. We've uh, uncovered a lot of interesting questions together, and I look forward to working with them going forward. I also want to thank Carrie and Jeff uh, for taking some of the uh, operational questions and issues on so that I can uh, expand a little more about how we're thinking scientifically and other goals uh, with respect to the TPMC. Um, and so the, the neuro working group in particular has been interested in identifying really core strengths of neurosciences across the system how to foster collaborative interactions to leverage those strengths and improve communication among our clinical and basic faculty. And really, in part, we're here to identify barriers to effective research collaboration and innovation in translational neurosciences. Uh, we've been engaged in that by, let's see if I can get that to go. I think I lost, oh, there we go. 
battery. Uh, we've been engaged in that by getting feedback from the neuroscience community, and we've met uh, at least 10 times as a group, uh, and have been involved in at least 11 conference calls. We've put out general calls for input. Uh, we've asked our individual working groups uh, members to act as liaisons across the system, uh, and in particular, we've been trying to interface with different neuro-related departments uh, through the Interdisciplinary Neuroscience Program, and I especially want to thank David Beversdorf and Andrew McClellan for acting as a conduit for us to reach as many neuroscientists as possible uh, here uh, at MU. And so with this, and I, and I, I, I honestly, there we go. Uh, with this, we've identified that uh, really the neurosciences rep are represented by diffuse and complex groups of highly motivated researchers in need of opportunities for cross-fostering ideas and avenues for communication, particularly between our clinicians and basic research faculty. And so ultimately that challenge is not limited to neuro, uh, but rather you could take the neuro out of that and say that is a challenge for all of us here across the UM system. And the opportunity comes in the form of the TPMC. The TPMC represents that opportunity for new and innovative research interactions that will improve the quality of life for Missourians and decrease the cost of healthcare in parallel. And where we really uh, uh, get to go here is to think about the potential, how collaboration in translational neuroscience is an integral part of this system with the potential to reach even greater impact with this strong investment in interdisciplinary research. And so uh, it's my, uh, I guess, pleasure to share with you uh, that potential that we see across the system in a few uh, examples. And, and by no means does this represent comprehensively what's out there. Um, I, I think we just found that these examples really exemplify some of these ideals for us. In UMKC at the Vision Research Center, they are engineering new retinas for glaucoma patients. They are using bioengineering and regenerative medicine uh, to rebuild damaged nerve cells in the eye. And on top of that, they are developing new uh, early diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease using eye exam technology that will potentially detect Alzheimer's long before these individuals become symptomatic, having clear uh, impacts on uh, the health of, of Missourians. In St. Louis, uh, they are using deep brain imaging to make predictive models uh, that uh, ultimately uh, will overlap and converge with computational approaches in artificial intelligence uh, to provide data-driven clinical tools to predict brain dynamics uh, and impacts on uh, outcomes, living, and mortality. The TPMC has a major emphasis on imaging technologies and computational and quantitative approaches. This exemplifies uh, how those two can be used together to impact the, of Missourian, the health of Missourians. Uh, out of arts and sciences and here at uh, Mizzou as well as across uh, the system, we are seeing new uh, neurobehavioral models of drug addiction that take research from the lab to the real world. Drug addiction, of course, has a major impact on people's lives. It's a major contributor to significant chronic diseases and has a tremendous economic impact uh, across the country as well as here in Missouri. Uh, and uh, with these uh, emerging uh, research projects that are being conducted, for example, in psychological sciences here at MU, uh, they are linking laboratory measures of brain activity with uh, actual drug use, drinking, et cetera, in participants' natural environments through collaborations with computer scientists, generating smartphone-based data collection that takes this out of the laboratory and into the real world. Um, and based on these strengths here at MU and across the system, uh, the UM system has recently announced the development of, the, of an interdisciplinary addiction center, the MoCare uh, uh, Project, Missouri Center on Addiction Research and Engagement, that is taking this to uh, new levels that I think will really impact people's lives. Our College of Veterinary Medicine is ensuring that our companion animal patient population is cared for as well as our human population. Uh, the comparative neurology program, for example, is generating uh, therapeutic development using a syst systematic approach of characterizing disease phenotypes in their patient populations, all the way through testing therapies and canine disease models for patient populations afflicted with these diseases, and then using this to form, uh, inform human clinical trials. And so we see this beautiful example of how uh, the Animal Molecular Genetic Disease Laboratory is identifying mutations associated with neurogenitive disease. They've identified over 48 of these mutations.
mutations uh, in this uh, uh, amazing problem. Uh, and, and based on those discoveries, are already uh, have two diseases in therapy development for canines that will also have strong impacts on therapeutic development for the human patient population as well. And then you may be wondering, uh, how does one take all of these diseases and this basic research and actually interface with the nervous system in order to affect health outcomes, in order to improve patient outcomes? And that's where our neuroengineering groups come in. Neuroengineering across the system is developing uh, advanced micro devices for treating things like addiction, mental health problems, uh, neurological diseases, and stroke. The neuro devices group is interested in uh, actual mechanical devices that can supplant missing neural activity within brains in the nervous system. And so, for example, instead of dropping electrodes deep into someone's brain, uh, we can use light technology combined with genetics to use uh, simple LED arrays in very, very precise patterns and orientation to take over some brain functions that may ultimately be damaged by disease. Uh, and so, for example, you can see with the mouse on the ball, when the light goes on, we are stimulating the part of the brain that controls movement. And when the light is off, that animal uh, is no longer driven to move. These sorts of stimulation technologies uh, will allow us to determine where in the brain electrical activity has gone wrong and replace that for these patient populations. We can not only stimulate, but we can integrate drug delivery into these implantable probes. We can deliver or monitor what's going on in the brain using uh, tiny drug reservoirs uh, and pump chambers that require no batteries and are entirely wireless. Uh, and so you can see some of these devices and the scale at which they are being developed uh, in the pictures on the left. And then uh, if uh, the cancer group, ha group has origami at the DNA level, the neuroengineers have origami at the electrode and other uh, arrays in the brain. So imagine being able to take a long, thin material that could act as an electrode, and the surgeon could implant this into the individual's brain or nervous system, and then based on the temperature of that person's body or the salinity of their uh, internal fluids, it then folds into a precise shape to encapsulate a nerve for uh, neurostimulation. And so these beautiful um, uh, origami soft electrode arrays have tremendous potential uh, to interface with um, uh, brain stimulation. Uh, and then finally, this is not just trapped within a lab. This is translating from the research lab to the marketplace. The small business incubator uh, and uh, the neuroengineers are taking these devices from the lab to fabrication to market. And so this is not something that's simply happening in a research lab, but it is impacting the economics of Missouri and the UM system as well. And so with that as a, a backdrop, what's next for the neuro group? Our major goal for the immediate future is to identify mechanisms where we can find common ground to move forward even further than these incredible examples of collaboration to form cohesive research teams across the system. We want to transform these successful individual research projects into centers and program project initiatives to go even farther, faster, and facilitate that integration of basic and clinical research across the UM system. Uh, our next concrete step to accomplish this is to generate the first UM system-wide neuroscience symposium in 2019. The interdisciplinary neuroscience program here at MU has been kind enough to take this charge with help from the TPMC Neuro Working Group. We are very excited to bring the system, clinicians, uh, basic researchers, administrators, uh, technologists together to really see how we can leverage these possibilities going further. I hope in 26 years I can claim we have the, tw actually I hope in 26 years I'm on a beach somewhere, I hope in 26 <laughs> years somebody can claim that we have the 26th annual system-wide symposium uh, following the wonderful example set by the cardiovascular group. And so with that I just want to thank the folks who provided some of this material and get out of the way for the rest of the presentations. Thank you. Just want to thank all of our incredible working group members again for all of their hard work. Um, if you're not excited, before we've, oh my gosh, this is so incredible and exceptional and they're not stopping now, they are moving full steam ahead. So next we get to hear from Rich McCown of Burns and McDonnell who is going to talk to us about the progress on this facility and the battery's dead it looks like so I'll bring it back to you and then they'll, they'll advance for you.
Well, I guess while we're waiting for batteries, I'll maybe, my name is Rich McCowan. I'm honored to be serving as the project manager for Burns and McDonnell. Obviously, we're responsible for the architecture and engineering of the project. Um, a little bit of background, you know, this project, you know, started several years ago from a programming standpoint and uh, really took charge again um, in September of this, of 2018. And since then, we've had about input from about 200 people within the university system and uh, over 200 meetings, all within the last 20 weeks. And it's been a very aggressive schedule. Uh, I do want to compliment the university on the folks being available and all the working groups, also in uh, the collaboration they've had and cooperation, because it's really been a, a, a very smooth process getting to this point. Um, so my goal here is to tell you a little bit more about the facility. You've heard from the working groups and what they're trying to do within the facility. I'm going to try and share some of the progress of the design itself. Uh, at the bottom there are some of the um, uh, visions we've had for the, for the project. Um, one of the things this project's going to have is going to be probably the most comprehensive from a research standpoint in the sense that it's going to have the most uh, up-to-date imaging equipment, microscopy equipment, lab equipment, and computational uh, equipment. And the, the goal there is making basically one facility to have all this happen in. So a little bit about the, the project budget. I'm going to start there. Um, right now, the, the, you see at the bottom line, the goal for the project is $220.8 million. And you can kind of see the buckets that's broken down by. I'm not going to go into detail a lot there. Um, as you see, though, quite a bit of that pricing is in the equipment and or, uh, furniture and utilities there. We talked a little bit about the major equipment. It's going to be very unique in the sense that it has the most comprehensive... Uh, oh, thank you. Uh, imaging equipment. Moving on. I got nothing. <laughs> Someone can advance it for me, maybe? All right. Elizabeth talked a little bit about the overall schedule for the project. This is really getting more detailed into the actual design and construction progress. As you'll see, there's a little bit of overlap between the detailed programming and the schematic design. One of the reasons for that is this is what we consider a fast track project. There's um, design pieces going on in, in the sense that we're moving utilities and getting the deep foundations while we're taking the time to make some of the final decisions on the overall facility. Uh, there's some milestone dates in there with the blue dots. Uh, with construction's actually going to be starting here in a few months, this early this spring. And the goal really is, is, is based on that end date of the, uh, that Elizabeth mentioned of 10-19-21 of the opening of the facility. So these are some of the types of spaces that are in the building. Um, it's unique in, in the sense that it's, in my, in, done, I've done about 35 of these types of buildings over my career, and this is the one that has the most comprehensive spaces for all of the, the functions that you're going to be using. I think a typical lab facilities on a university campus have the wet lab, dry labs, uh, vivarium is very specialized, but the fact that um, we're also going to have the computational and, uh, and the collaboration that's going on related to all the different uh, users of the building is very unique. Another piece of this that is fairly unique is this innovation space, and I don't think anyone's necessarily talked about that yet, but the goal here is really to bring a, a, a independent business into the facility to be collaborative and to also occupy parts of the facility and use part of this equipment. Uh, I think Elizabeth mentioned a little bit about, about the partners that you want to have in the facility. And we're going to talk a little bit about, about how that functions within the facility as we go through the floor plans. This isn't your building, obviously. This is just some, some of the typical spaces that are going to be in the building as far as the imaging, uh, the lab spaces, and uh, some of the collaboration spaces. Just to give you an idea of what the building's about. So now getting into the building program itself. Um, this, this slide's fairly busy, um, and I'll give you some of the acronyms. On the top left is the assignable square footage for each of the different uh, components of the facility. There's efficiency goals, and, and you know, as in any building, there's corridors, there's bathrooms, there's stairwells, there's those sorts of things. So the difference between assignable square feet and gross square feet really comes into those other spaces. Um, and then on the right there, you'll see the percentage by type of uh, function in the facility. And the graph on the right kind of illustrates it a little bit better as far as proportions of the, of the building. As you see, everything below that orange line is what we call high-intensity spaces or, or uh, lab spaces. Uh, you'll see also the collaborative spaces. The intent here is for this building to be highly collaborative between all the uh, users of the building. Uh, the innovation space we mentioned, we'll talk a little bit, bit more about that as far as how that's going to function related to bringing this outside industry into the building. And there's some office functions as well. 
So one of the concepts we developed early in design on this was we, not only is it a pretty aggressive schedule, but the budget's uh, fairly tight, and I think we wanted to make sure we were making good uh, financial decisions. And one of the things that came about in doing that is trying to, to, the sense that lab facilities are very expensive, office facilities don't have to be. And what we've done is really uh, developed an idea that there's going to be a lab bar to this building and an office or collaborative uh, portion of this building with the sense that one part is going to be more expensive, one's going to be less expensive. Uh, and the goal really is just to get the most bang for your buck. What we didn't want to do is have offices spread about in a lab building where you're using the same types of HVAC systems and electrical systems and things that are really overkill for those types of facilities. Overall, you'll see here, oh, I'm sorry, can go back just a minute here. Uh, there's a number of functions in this building that are very sensitive for a number of reasons. Uh, the, in the basement, we're having the imaging equipment and the mi microscopy equipment and the vivarium. Uh, they're sensitive for a number of reasons, one being vibration. Uh, obviously, how we get animals in and out of this building is a sensitive issue related to, you know, aesthetics. Um, and then as you move up through the building, what we didn't want to do is have individual empires, if you will. We've really made this building very collaborative in that there's overlap between all of the different user groups in the facility to aid in that collaboration. On the right there is really the, the idea that we have the office spaces. On the left is, is where the lab spaces are. And I'll kind of explain that more as we get into the individual floor plans themselves. So one of the other challenges um, to this type of facility is you have really at least five or six different user types. You know, one being the typical users of the building, which are going to be your uh, principal investigators and grad students, you know, research type people. One is going to be companion animals that are dropped off. One is the animals from the vivarium. Uh, one is going to be just general public. This building will have a cafeteria, for instance, and some other public spaces. Uh, there's some clinical patients that are coming from the hospital, and there's some research patients that are part of the uh, research that's going on the facility. And one of the challenges, how do we, uh, you know, devise entrances to the building that are unique, that are easy to find, and that uh, deal with some of this issue of the sensitivity of those overlaps of those different functions. Uh, this plan kind of sh show a little bit also about the location of the facility, if you're not familiar with it. Uh, it's, it's currently a parking lot there. There's an existing UPMB medical office building on the northwest corner of the site, uh, and it's bounded by the Hospital Drive on the south and the Virginia Avenue on the east. Um, there's some challenges here related to a number of things, one being the access to the building, one being the elevations of the building, because there's, there's about an 18-foot drop in the site from the northeast to the southwest, and then also trying to function with the operation of the UPMB building both during construction and afterwards as far as having everything work together. We're, our goal is to maintain the drop-off area there for the UMP during the entire uh, construction of this process, and we've worked very closely with the users to understand how that's going to work uh, in developing that. So starting now a little bit with the floor plans and, and starting in the basement, this is not getting down to the level of room by room, which we have gotten to that point, but this is really just kind of talking kind of high level about where things exist within the facility. Uh, there will be a tunnel coming from the UPMB building, which keeps that connectivity between the hospital and this facility to all be in, inside uh, as flow from building to building. As we mentioned, the vivariums in the basement of the building, as well as the imaging and the microscopy functions, primarily due to... Um, the sensitivity of the vibration on those spaces. Moving up a floor, this is really ground level now. Um, the, the function on the, in the greenish area there called lobby and event is really the public spaces in the building and the main entrance. Uh, there will be a cafe on the main floor. Um, there is a visualization lab, which is a function you currently have on campus, and we're going to move that to actually a, a really high profile place within this facility, because I think that's an opportunity really to display what's going on in the facility, both from a uh, within the uh, campus folks themselves, but also to outside industry if you're going to hold functions and those sorts of things within the building. There's also a fairly large event space here that's going to allow large conferences and those sorts of things, which also can flow to outside in a courtyard that's going to be a pretty nice area for um, entertaining on, on, on good weather days. Generally, you'll see throughout the building, we've kind of color-coded everything by function, and I think that goes back to those, that stacking diagram that we showed. And I think it's consistently through all these slides, you'll kind of keep track of on the top left what those spaces are. Uh, there is a, a fairly sizable component for the GMP spaces, and the idea here that we're really getting from bench top to bedside, that there is pilot-scale manufacturing of the, of the uh, pharmaceuticals and, and uh, products that are being developed within the facility. Next slide. 
So the second, third, and fourth floors of this building are all intended to be identical. I think there'll be some unique cha changes to that based on the program as it develops. But in, in general, the, the major, the purple areas are the dry, or sorry, the wet labs and the support spaces for those labs. The blue areas are the uh, areas where the grad students would be potentially, predominantly housed. Um, the dark blue areas are the PI offices, and the yellowish areas are the innovation areas that we talked about. And the idea here is that we really have three floors of innovation space. Um, there's going to be some challenges as we move through this process in identifying who, the, who these outside industries are that are going to be occupying this facility and how they play into the research. Um, we've developed these so that these can be individual spaces. In other words, you could have multiple tenants or one big tenant on each floor, which has some flexibility. You know, in the, as the building develops and also in the future if, you, if there's changes to those folks that are within the building itself. Next slide. So this is just kind of a, a, a rendering here looking at the overall lab portions of the facility. Uh, the idea here is we want this to be very transparent and very collaborative and if you notice on the far right or top right up there is in that same plan that we just showed you is where those grad students would be housed. The lab functions are then in the middle area there with all glass basically from the east moving towards the west. A lot of uh, open daylight and, and very uh, open spaces. And then on the, the west side of the building over here would be basically where some of those support spaces would be. Next slide, please. And these are just going through some of the interior renderings of the facility. Uh, obviously, we just finished concept design, so a lot of these are just in development, but really helping our users understand kind of the volume and the use and the function of these spaces and how they're going to look. Uh, one of the challenges that we had is obviously uh, trying to be very respectful of the cost, but also make this a very iconic building on the campus. You know, both to the location and to the function of this building, it really needs to be uh, a major focus on the campus. And the, the, what we're really doing is trying to focus money where those spaces are very more impactful and less money where it's not as, as uh, necessary. Uh, on the top right there, you see a little bit about that visualization area. I think with current technology and visualization, there's a lot of opportunity from a display standpoint to really you know, show off what's going on in this facility to the public. As I mentioned, there will be a, a seminar room or a fairly large conference room for uh, functions like this, if you will. Uh, there's an interpretive space, which is really more this, this idea that we're collaborating. What we want to do is have all the different colleges and uh, researchers really share what's going on within themselves so that they can really work together. I think this is the last one. There will be a cafe on that main floor, as I mentioned. And the main lobby is going to be a two-story. So okay, now, now the fireworks here. <laughs> now, I will mention these are early draft concept renderings. I think the goal here is making sure that, you know, from a budget standpoint and a um, constructability standpoint, we're currently working with, the, with Whiting Turner, who's the general contract, to ensure that we're on the right track here. But this is basically looking kind of an aerial view from the southeast, looking northwest. You can... I don't know if this works on here or not, but you can kind of see the UPMB building on the top left there. It's kind of clouded in. That's the existing facility on site. There's an existing parking garage also to the west here. Uh, Hospital Drive would be on the, this direction and then uh, Virginia Avenue running down the right. So this is basically the east side of the building and that, that large glass area that I talked about with the uh, open daylight flowing through the entire facility. The idea here is that the, the building on the bottom right there, that's the lab component we discussed. The, the <coughs> building then that's attached to it on the left side there is, is the office areas or more uh, administrative functions. This is basically the same perspective but more from the ground level of the same facility. The idea here is to make it a very modern building. Uh, it's going to be unique on the campus, which I think we're very excited about. And I think both with the location of the building and the functions building, it's going to be very interesting. This kind of shows an idea of what this courtyard could look like for the public spaces. Uh, the cafe and main entrance is be in this corner of the building and the, the area that's shown kind of more this open area, you know, whether it's landscape, whether it's not. We have to work through some of those details, but we're excited about the opportunities for that space to be very exciting and very useful on the campus. This is looking from the southwest back towards the northeast. This is basically that office tower. The main entrance would be around to the left on this image. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rich. Uh, 
beautiful, and, and I know he likes to always sit, remind, early concept draft, right? Not, not set in stone yet, uh, but gorgeous, thank you. Uh, next we have uh, Ryan Rapp and Rhonda Gibbler who will uh, talk finances with us. I think you might try it, we'll see. we'll see. Oh, you don't have slides, okay. No. Thank you. Uh, we don't have any exciting slides with, like what you just saw. So, um, I don't know about Ryan, but as I sat there watching all this amazing science, I now understand more why people say, how can you do the job you do? Because <laughs> what we do is it's just not that exciting. And I guess my answer, and I think I can speak for Ryan, is our job becomes more interesting because this is amazing <laughs> that we're, we're able to contribute to something like this. As far as just a brief update on the finances, uh, as the president announced, uh, with the strategic investments related to the Missouri compacts, we, we've committed 50 million in one-time funds uh, to the to the TPMC project. And with the campus, uh, I'll let Rhonda address what they're going to do to match. So um, we're um, committed to finding 25 million dollars from our central reserves. We we hold funds for strategic initiatives as well as for contingency planning. We also plan to partner with schools and colleges as they have direct um, benefit from these programs to come up with another 25 million. So that as a campus we can commit to coming up with 50 million um, in addition to the 50 million that Ryan just mentioned. And we also expect that there are uh, collaborations um, working with philanthropy, working with the federal and state government and other partners that there are a variety of ways that um, we'll pull together the total set of funding. Um, and one of the important parts of it um, is that we have a, a period of time to pull this all together. And I know um, oftentimes when I talk to people, they really hope that every penny is already sitting somewhere. Um, when you do the kind of work that we do, we have to be flexible just like um, you do in your science role. You don't always know the exact answer the minute you start that, but what we do know is that we're the kind of institution that when we make a commitment of this nature, it's quite within our reach to put together either through some amount of short-term financing, through the, the resources we can bring to bear in cash, through the partnerships we can pull together. So we, we feel very confident that this is an investment that builds the financial future of the university. So. And now we will have Cameron Farwell talk about the marketing. Of course, as, as with all the incredible things that happen across the system, we sometimes don't tell our story well enough of the incredible things that uh, we're doing and then what this represents. So that's what uh, Cameron Farwell will be working on and will share with us. Thank you. OK. I have exactly one slide, but with this one slide, I'm looking to put you all to work. Um, we have, but I'm going to give you a toolbox eventually uh, in the next couple of months to do it. And, and really, our work is communicating what you all know about now. Now you know about the amazing things that this facility and this initiative across the state means. But for a lot of people in Missouri, they, they have heard something about a TPMC and a PMI and they think it's a building. And so what you heard today is that this is about cures for our people. This is about a driver of economic development for our state. It's about, it's a key part of our research ambitions at all four of our universities. And it's a place for industry to connect with the amazing scholarship of our universities and bring it to patients faster. So I'm going to need all of your help and, and really everyone who knows about this to get these points across because that's really what it's about. It's about much more than a building. So um, what we're going to be looking at is creating a toolbox of materials that hopefully will help us all create a common language about how we talk about these projects. As you can see, it's very complicated. There's a lot of aspects. So we'll be looking for some common language. Then we're going to be developing what we call, in, in my work, one-pagers, which is essentially an elevator pitch. Um, and the material on those one-pagers will tell the, tell the stories that I've just talked about and direct them at certain audiences, because donors are wanting to contribute to, to curers. 
um, recruits for this potential project, they're wanting to hear more about the science. So we need to talk about how we're going to talk to the, to the different audiences. And then we also need to talk about how we talk about this through the lens of our different universities. So the communicators at all of our universities have been working together to talk about how each university plugs into this project and how exciting it is for each one of us and, and our strengths. And then, um, I know you're all attached to the TPMC name, but we are gonna be looking at finding a name that is easier for everyone to say and understand, um, hopefully by the end of this month or early next. And then we'll be having PowerPoint templates that will help all of us talk about this in, in a common way with graphics and so forth to help everyone really show people in simple ways what can be accomplished. And then finally, I think we really need to show the human impact. We need to see how this project will affect the lives of people here in Missouri and elsewhere. And so we will be developing a series of videos that really show what we can achieve with this project. That's it. Okay, I'm going to ask Robert Driver. Tom Hiles can't be with us today. So Robert Driver is going to share the philanthropy report. Thank you, Dean LeBoa. It's a pleasure to be here on behalf of Tom Hiles, our Vice Chancellor for Advancement here at Mizzou, as well as all of my advancement colleagues <clears throat> at Mizzou and at the, the other campuses, UMSL, s and and UMKC. We've been working together uh, to try to uh, uh, advance and execute on a, a philanthropy plan that's going to support this uh, facility. I hope and believe, and I hope you also share with me in believing that philanthropy and the recruitment of uh, private support is absolutely critical to the University of Missouri in it achieving its greatest destiny. That's true, of course, also for TPMC. Slide, please. So I want to share with you some of the activity that we've been focused on in the last year and where we've been putting resources to accelerate uh, the, uh, the, the recruitment of new private support. We started by really sort of stake, taking a step back and looking at some of our key um, key constituents and see uh, if we could begin to socialize and educate about this pro uh, process and what this uh, initiative is going to be about. So we hired an outside consultant who has helped us on a number of projects in the past and knows the university intimately. That consultant uh, helped with us to educate uh, 75 participants through leadership briefings. Uh, we selected 32 of those persons or company representatives to sit in uh, an interview process for a feasibility study. Uh, the consultant came back after the feasibility study and noted that uh, capital dollars are in fact difficult to raise nationally, um, but nevertheless what he heard from that study was that 75 million from philanthropy uh, would be a stretch but may be very well doable. And as we began to massage that and think about that, we thought about all of the aspects of philanthropy, not just giving philanthropy, but also venture philanthropy and business partnerships, strategic partnerships. And as we begin to think about that from a capital perspective, supportive research that's going to be uh, in this uh, facility and in this initiative, as well as other programmatic items, in-kind giving and so on, we begin to think that a 75 to $100 million range is attainable and we've set forth on working on that. Uh, some of the recommendations that came also out of the feasibility study included uh, to sharpen and align our messaging so that we, we uh, can more effectively talk to people in an inspirational fashion that will inspire giving. Uh, to address some of the study participants' concerns, which include, included the name TPMC, and uh, we are uh, doing that now, as Cameron referenced, as well as some concerns from some of our alums, donors, and others that said, we want to make sure, we want to see that collaboration is actually happening before we invest in that. And so they want to see collaboration at Mizzou, they want to see collaboration between the campuses, and they want to see collaboration with Missouri, metro areas, and a broader public. And so we are doing that, and I hope you're getting the inspirational message from that today, that those collaborations are occurring. And they also asked us to consider appointing a staff person. We have a lot of people on our advancement teams that are involved in spending a good amount of time working on TPMC, but to have a point person that's going to be thinking about it 24-7 and triaging that is also important, and we are in the final stages of doing that now. Our progress to date, we have grown our prospect list from that initial original 40 or 50 that we were looking at in the feasibility process. We've doubled that now to 105 engaged prospects. Uh, about a third of them are corporate 
entities, and uh, two-thirds, three-fourths of them are individuals. Uh, we have made 129 substantive or giving contacts with that prospect base. 90 of those were personal visits. We found that eight donor prospects have declined to invest in the project. We are going to find that in some cases, either research or a facility or capital may not be a top priority for some of our donors. But for many, we are discovering, fortunately, there is an interest. And we have secured to the date uh, about $4.3 million in new funding for this project. Uh, we have current proposals out to uh, donor prospects who are considering support in the range of $9.5 million currently. And we have uh, proposals planned from engagement that we've uh, undertaken uh, that uh, measures to about $16.7 million currently, and that is growing given um, our ongoing efforts. We, have, we know that we have 18 scheduled meetings in the next three months. We are bringing people to campus. We are going out and visiting biomedical firms and talking with individuals who are likely to support this project as well. We want to, uh, as we do that, we're very thrilled now to have uh, renderings uh, and the opportunity with the design concepts in place to begin to place naming opportunities on that. That, of course, will lead to more inspired conversations with our prospects. And so uh, we wanted everyone to know that we're going to be putting values on naming the whole Precision Medicine Initiative as well as the facility. The three signature centers, which will be technically virtual naming opportunities for neurovascular and oncology, will be highly recognized in the, in the center. Uh, the Innovation Tower, which you just saw, the Collaboration Hub, the Courtyard, Laboratory and Diagnostic Spaces, Research Offices, uh, Teaching Spaces, Graduate Student Spaces, and so on, all will be uh, naming opportunities and opportunities for us to market to those who may support us. So going forward, uh, with uh, private support as well as uh, strategic business partnerships, uh, we are continuing to collaborate with our system universities and our advancement teams across the system to look at and to, uh, to work on uh, joint prospects of interest. We are assembling an advisory board. We've uh, d defined what that board will do, but largely they're there to help us and assist us in making those kinds of contacts and thinking strategically about how all of this wonderful work our scientists are doing is going to affect the world and how we can tell that story. That advisory board should be approximately eight to 10 people from largely from biomedical leadership and others who can help us with that mission. We talked about the naming opportunities. Those are very important. Collateral marketing materials are being developed right now and we look forward to having more of that. And by the way, uh, Burns and Mac showed us uh, they have the capability of creating fly through of the building and showing each space uh, visually. And we're looking forward to working with you on that and having that in our toolbox as well. Um, we are working with proposal and gift agreement templates that all four campuses can use in our conversations. And then as the Board of Curators takes up this project and considers it in May, we very soon thereafter are looking to have a ceremonial groundbreaking where we will highlight uh, this, this major project, bring people who have supported us and highlight them uh, at that point and also hope to inspire many others who have the potential to, to advance this ball. That's where we stand with advancement today. Thank you. Dusty Schneider's can't be with us, so President Choi will give us a government relations update. Thank you. Thank you, President. Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. As I was sitting there, I'm thinking to myself, there is not a more exciting opportunity for bringing the best minds together from all over Missouri to solve a problem that is national in scope. So I want to take this opportunity to thank all of the people who've gathered together and really worked hard during the past, past uh, at least six months working on this project. As we think about the next steps, we have to really focus on the fact that this is the highest priority that we have for the UM system. What that means is that while we have other priorities, we need to make the decision to say that when we have investment opportunities like this, there are also going to be projects that we are not going to be able to support. That is not to say that it's not important, but imagine the opportunity to bring faculty members, clinicians, students from all four universities working on a project that is not designed 
to develop more articles or citations. Those are all great things. But the key outcome for this is improving healthcare in Missouri and beyond. So I love the fact that we are thinking big and the fact that we are on a very tight timeline. October 19th, 2021 is the day that we're gonna open the building and we're deeply, deeply committed to it. Because the project is Missouri in scope, but also national in scope, we are seeking partners. The project cost of $228 million is just for the building. We want to equip it with the latest and most modern research instrumentation. We want to provide endowments for creative research that can support both the basic sciences and clinical research. Because of that importance, we are going to be seeking partners at the state level and the national level. Now, in the governor's budget that came out earlier in January, he has placed the TPMC as a line item. Now, it's a placeholder with $1 million, and we all know that that is not enough. So our hope is over the next six months is to work with the legislature and the governor's office to really talk about the exciting breakthroughs that we're gonna have and the difference that we can make in the lives of Missourians. And our hope is to, over the next five to seven years, to get five million per year to help support the continuing activities of the TPMC. Now, the TPMC is moving forward. Groundbreaking will be probably sometime in June or July this year. We are gonna build a building, but the TPMC is not just the building. It's a broad array of activities that we're gonna be leading that talks about our ability to make a difference in healthcare broadly for Missouri and the nation. So in addition to the state support, our folks have been working with the federal government and they were able to work with David Isaacs from the VA hospital here in Columbia to include in the VA budget $50 million for a collaborative laboratory space that will be located as part of the TPMC. That's the exciting part. Now we need to have the White House actually authorize that spending. So we made a special request to the White House to authorize the $50 million in spending. If that's the case, towards a $228 million building, we would have $150 million in place through the VA and internal resources. This project began in 2014 as a concept. And during that period, because of activities and events that occurred on this campus, we lost focus. Now with new leadership, Chancellor Cartwright, uh, Mark McIntosh as vice president, and Elizabeth Loboa serving as the Vice Chancellor of Strategic Initiatives, we have the leadership combined with the chancellors at the other universities to say, we're gonna make this happen. And so I wanna thank all of you for your support. Hold that October 19, 2021 date as a time where we're gonna have the ground, not the groundbreaking, the grand opening of the TPMC. So thank you for your support, thank you. So we do have time for questions, and it looks like there's some people with microphones walking around. Or, or some, there's stations right here. Thank you, thank you. So if you have questions, come on up, and, and maybe people who presented, if you want to be close to the front and be ready to answer here or to the microphones. Hi, Leslie Lines from uh, the vet school. I was wondering uh, how many tier one and tier two applications came through that you guys get to consider for boosting our uh, research efforts? A lot. A lot. Good, good. 
Um, so uh, I, I saw uh, from all four universities, uh, there were 89 tier two proposals that came in, totaled about 50 something million dollars. Uh, and uh, uh, a little over 30 tier one proposals that came in, it totaled about $80 million. So it, it was a, an incredible response by our faculty. Uh, it really shows uh, that plus what you saw from the three working groups today really shows that our faculty are really engaged in the concept now of working across boundaries together to start moving the university forward pretty dramatically. Um, we're not going to be able to fund all of those tier ones and tier twos, obviously. We have a very big job in front of us to work through the process, to find places of intersection among these proposals, uh, to look for opportunities uh, to leverage uh, activities on each of the four universities to something bigger and better. That process, uh, we, we, we've got the review process now moving forward uh, by March the 15th. We expect to be able to identify the tops of those projects and solicit full-scale proposals from them. In the meantime, there'll be conversations going back and forth with the investigators to try to help you put forward the best proposal that you can. The nice thing also about it is not only is, is the system coming up with $10 million a year for the next five years to support these kinds of things, but the campuses are really coming forward now to put up resources to match these proposals. Really, uh, that was really the driving force behind this. So I think what you can see from those tier one and tier two proposals is the TPMC and lots of other things, related things going on around these campuses is already moving forward. Faculty are really beginning to collaborate and work together to get these things done. So thank you for all of, uh, all of the faculty and staff who've put these things together. It's a big job, but I think uh, uh, we are very excited about the response to this program. I'll ask a question then. Um, TPMC, oh, are you here? Oh, uh, Adam Shrum, uh, been here about a year and a half in several of the departments in uh, School of Medicine and College of Engineering. So uh, I love my lab, I have a great lab. It lives in another building and then, then the new building. And so what I wanna ask is um, the relationship between uh, the building and then what sounds like this much grander vision, which is maybe the center aspect of it. So, so, so many uh, investigators will be involved, right, in this translational pipeline and in this translational uh, uh, movement of their work besides just being in the building. So the building is headquarters, maybe, and, and this, the center is much vaster than that. Uh, what's the relationship between those two, how we could be full participants, like outside and inside the building? Absolutely. That is exactly right. So the building is going to house um, facilities with the, the vivarium, the clean room space, the, the really cutting edge, leading edge imaging capabilities. These are all can be thought of as service centers. Uh, th this is access for all faculty across, across all the universities and frankly for industry partners too that want to use those. The Precision Medicine Initiative, and I think this is part of the aspect of really trying to come up with a name that better encompasses what this means. The Precision Medicine Initiative is just touched a bit by the incredible research we heard about from the working groups and what they're doing now across the whole system. So we'll have 60 PIs who are housed in the actual facility with their, with their working groups. But those PIs, the people in there, they might assemble, disassemble. They're, they're very much um, flexible depending on what is the leading science. But the people in the building are not the only in individuals who are representing our Precision Medicine Initiative. It is much broader than that. And the center grants, of course, we talk about uh, some of those might be in the, in the building, others might be faculty and scientists and clinicians um, across all, all four of the, the universities. So it is much broader. Um, did that fully address your question? Did you have any? Yeah, President wants to add to that. So not only will this facility and the initiative support precision medicine, 
But if you think about the core instrumentation that are going to be available, they'll serve the research needs of even broader, broader range of research. For example, with the electron microscopy laboratory, that can be used to look at cellular level activities, but as well as materials that can be used for hypersonics. But currently, we do not have a world-class facility for microscopy at any one of our universities. So it'll serve that purpose. And the high performance computing and visualization facility that we're gonna have as part of this can be used for social science research as well. And so think of this as providing that opportunity for all researchers who really want to create nationally successful activities as providing that opportunity. So thank you for that question. Great question. Yes, others. Yes, Stephen? Dr. Siegel? Thank, thank you. So I see the Missouri acting as a hub for what may, may be happening nationally, but it's a world out there. And so I know folks have been traveling to Europe, looking at uh, in various industries that might in, uh, interact with us here. So can you say something about the international aspect of what we're doing here? Do you want to take it first? And then Mark? Why don't you take it first? Yeah, well, I don't know if you want to listen. Yeah, so uh, obviously, uh, um, uh, you know, the immediate impact is on this campus and the university system as a whole across the state. But some of the partners that we're talking to are partners that are involved in global health all over the world. We've taken trips to um, Germany to talk to Siemens. They will be on this campus next week to talk to us a little bit more about a partnership. Uh, and that partnership, by the way, is not just in um, imaging uh, technologies and so on and so forth. It's about the, the entire of healthcare delivery. What we offer them is a rural health network where things that happen in the laboratory, we can immediately look to translation out into the community. The best example is um, Marilyn Rance and Marge Skubik, who have partnered from the School of Nursing and the College of Engineering to build sensors where people can live in their homes uh, a, a, a much, much longer than having to have assisted facility uh, situations. So those kinds of technologies, getting those technologies out into the community is really what we're trying to do. And there are several global partners that we're talking about. Siemens is one. If you think about electron microscopy technologies, uh, we need to be talking to worldwide providers of, of microscopy uh, capabilities about a partnership in, in terms of those technologies. So Thermo Fisher and Zeiss and, and, uh, and other uh, 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 imaging uh, technology experts to be a part of the, the capabilities. We already have an ongoing partnership with Cerner that's been going on for many years now. Cerner has 25? Uh, uh, faculty, uh, uh, people actually embedded on this campus already, working us, with us on rural health, the electronic medical record, and so on and so forth. Roche from uh, Switzerland is now is partnering with us in something that we call the Tumor Board. It's being marketed as a product called Navify, uh, where they can get um, um, basic research out into the community. So those are the kinds of partnerships, uh, those are the kinds of things we're looking at. It really does have a global um, scope. So I'll be going to the Netherlands later this year and I was looking at the University of Utrecht and they have an incredible program in regenerative medicine. That happens to be one of my interests. And so beyond just the technology, it would seem that the, the science, the various programs that are developing internationally might be hubs or, or act, you know, spokes that we could tie into yeah. scientifically. And, and, and I think we see that across all of our working groups. And you know, you've been engaged in our working groups. Those are the kinds of things we want to bring forward. So, so you saw some, uh, just a snapshot of the really exciting science that's going on right now. Uh, we, we, we're going to find partners for that science, and, we, and, and some of the faculty are going to be uh, within the state of Missouri, some of the faculty are going to be national, and I assume some of our collaborators are going to be international. Thank you. And Steve, since you're on one of the working groups now, we'll just add that to the task of the next thing you all have to do, okay? <laughs> just okay. I think we have time for one more question. Anybody? And if, if nothing, I would ask if the Chancellor or President would like to say any last comments. Uh, 
Chancellor. This has been, uh, from my perspective, such an incredible, um, incredible day, and I, I thank everybody again for all the work. But Chancellor? Thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, I just actually want to echo the thank you to everybody that's been working so hard on this. Um, you know, it's always very exciting to actually hear about great science, hear about the great things that are happening, all the people coming together. And this is leveraging capability that is in so many different places. And that's, I think, what's going to make the difference here, um, is bringing those people together, giving them the tools that are needed, and allowing them to then pursue the grand challenges around three critical areas for society. Um, you know, one thing we haven't talked about is that we're also very interested in, and Elizabeth mentioned this at the beginning, but the arts, the humanities, education, social sciences, they are all part of this larger network of addressing grand challenges for society. And we want to make sure that they feel equally as included, that they're able to come in. You'll notice some of the uh, spaces were for collisions to allow people to come together and talk about these problems. That is actually what we envision, is that we can all work together uh, to best, for the best uh, outcomes that we're looking for. So it's an exciting time. It's really good to see that we are you know, really going to have a world-class facility on this campus in a couple of years, considering the last one was 2004. So that's exciting for us. So we're really looking forward to how we make this happen for Missouri how we make this happen for society. And I really do want to thank all of the people who are involved. Thank you for taking the time to prepare the presentations. Thank you uh, for allowing you know, everybody here to hear about the exciting things that are going on. And I'm just really thrilled that we have so many great leaders that are willing to step up and make this happen. So thank you. Thank you all. There's leftover food. Feel free to take it. We've got hungry grad students back in the labs. Feed them. <laughs>